Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. I, my name is Allison Grantham, and I am with Growell Consulting on behalf of the National Academies Committee to advise the US Global Change Research Program, the US GCRP. I welcome you to this listening session on global change issues with a specific focus on food related challenges and opportunities. Through USGCRP, federal agencies coordinate climate and global change, change research and use the results to create tools and assessments to help people make decisions in the context of global change. Through this session and others in this five-part series, we aim to connect more directly with users and researchers who are building on and applying global change information and tools in their work and to gather insights and information that the USGCRP can consider as it plans the implementation of its work over the coming decade. In these sessions, we are welcoming staff from the USGCRP and agencies that comprise the USGCRP, members of the National um, Academies Committee to advise the USGCRP, of which I am a member, and all of you, users and researchers who are engaged in building on and applying the types of knowledge and tools that the US GCRP is charged with developing and supporting. We recognize this is a National Academies event on topics that are of critical importance to all of us. And we are trying this different approach for providing input and engagement to support US GCRP in its work. Please bring your insights and enthusiasm to this session. I think, uh, so um, can we, should, should we move ahead to the agenda? Yep, next slide, please. All right, so in today's agenda, we have a series of speakers who will provide remarks all of whom expressed interest in contributing when registering for this session. Everyone here will have opportunities to contribute through an engagement platform that we will introduce shortly. Representatives from the US GCRP and the committee to advise the US GCRP are attending in listening mode today. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to hearing from you over the next 90 minutes. Um, Next slide. All right, um, to start, I'd like to acknowledge that while today we are gathered virtually, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nacochtank and Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it through, throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. We also acknowledge that our understanding of food and global change issues are closely related to and informed by indigenous knowledge and experience and that many Native communities are on the front line of impacts from these changes. I am joining from New Jersey, the traditional land of the Lenni Lenape people. Next slide, please. Okay. I and other members of the committee to advise the US GCRP are looking forward to these sessions to connect directly with researchers and users who are using and applying global change information in their work. As part of our regular meetings throughout the year, we provide this and other opportunities to engage with and hear from broad audiences to inform this important work. The goals of this listening session, these, this series of listening sessions include gathering useful, actionable input for USGCRP for implementation of its work, making connections and expanding the group of researchers and user, users who are directly engaging with the USGCRP and its work, to recognize connections across researchers, users, and the themes of USGCRP work and products, and 
to inform potential future engagement mechanisms and opportunities, including forms, approaches, and participants for such engagement. All right, next slide. Um, guidance for input. Today, we are seeking input on how USGCRP may implement its work to better understand and address global change issues. You do not need to be familiar with USGCRP to provide input. We are specifically seeking to connect with a broader audience in these sessions. If you are unfamiliar with USGCRP, we hope you had a chance to view the introduction video on our event pages before the session or encourage you to view it afterwards. In preparing for these listening ses sessions, USGCRP requested input and insights on the following themes to inform the implementation of its strategic priorities and activities. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, which actions should be prioritized to fully incorporate these values in research, community engagement, and workforce development? How do we implement them? Advancing science, what are the priority gaps in foundational science and methods that require enhanced long-term investments? Use-inspired research. How do we ensure that USGCRP science and products are better driven by and connected to users, including, for example, improved use of consultation, collaboration, translation, dissemination, informing client climate services, and socioeconomic sciences integration. Socioeconomic sciences integration. What are the priorities for integrating socioeconomic sciences into our program and to inform critical decisions? Particularly helpful feedback might include ideas on emerging large scale scientific questions related to global change and or response, especially those where interagency collaboration will be critical. Specific information on how science is or is not being used to inform societal response to global change and why, and knowledge gaps and obstacles to implementing scientific tools or knowledge. To ensure all have time to speak, we will be holding you to the five minute limit. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so there are other input opportunities. The USGCRP is seeking public comment on the prospectus for its National Global Change Research Plan 2022 to 2031. The opportunity to provide comment runs through January 11th, 2022. The prospectus can be accessed by, by visiting USGCRP's review and comment system. And I also saw that it was just posted in the chat. Um, this is an open call. All comments must be input via the um, USGCRP's review and comment system by 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on January 11th, 2022 for consideration. For more information on this call to comment, please see the Federal Register notice or visit USGCRP's website. While these listening sessions may help inform the development or implementation of this plan, individual feedback on the prospectus should be submitted through the public comment mechanism. In support of the fifth National Climate Assessment, USGCRP and National Climate Assessment authors will host a series of workshops in January and February to solicit feedback on climate change related issues that are important to the public. The information gathered in these workshops will help the authors determine which topics to cover in their chapters of the fifth National Climate Assessment. See the USGCRP website for details on these workshops, and the link um, is also in the, just shared in the chat. Okay, um, next slide, please. All right, expectations for conduct. We are committed to fostering a professional, 
respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identity-based factors. Please report misconduct immediately um, Stephen, uh, to Stephen Stitcher, um, and his email is here. Um, and the National Academy's policy on preventing discrimination, harassment, and bullying is also available on the event page for the listening session. Um, okay, I think. Sorry, was there someone, Stephen, did you? I'll take it. I'll take it from here. Okay, I would like to pass it now back over to Stephen. Thank you very much. Great. Well, uh, next slide, please. Um, thanks, for everyone, for joining, and Allison for that welcome on behalf of the committee. Um, for these listening sessions, uh, we have a couple of modes to hear from you and for you to interact with each other. Um, for the rest of this session, we will hear from participants who indicated during registration an interest in providing oral comments. At the same time, we have available the Zoom Q&A uh, mechanism to capture key points from speakers and contributions from all of you. Um, if you have any issues with either this Zoom platform, either the Zoom platform or the Q&A, please send a chat to the host via Zoom or an email. Greenaway, who is, um, whose uh, contact information is listed here on the slide. Um, today, we have a series of speakers who will provide oral remarks on the theme of global change in food. The first set of speakers were the first ones to indicate during registration interest in providing oral remarks. Um, these speakers will all appear with video. Um, we have, throughout the session, closed captioning available. The transcript, the live transcript is available through the live transcript icon in the Zoom menu bar. Um, also through the Zoom platform, we'll be using the Q&A functionality for input to USGCRP from anyone who is participating in today's session. Despite the Q&A uh, in the title and the name of this functionality, we're looking for your thoughts and recommendations and guidance to USGCRP on this or other global change themes rather than questions. Um, as Allison indicated, USGCRP is here in listening mode and will not be answering questions. So we look forward to your input through the Q&A window. Um, and, uh, but again, we're looking for your thoughts and recommendations on their work going forward uh, rather than specifically questions. Um, I'd like to invite Amanda on just to talk about how we're handling the last part of the session. Amanda. Sure, thanks, Stephen. Um, I just wanted to indicate, as as uh, Stephen mentioned, that when people signed up to uh, to attend, there were folks that that indicated they wanted to provide oral remarks, um, and we do have a number of um, a couple of the people who indicated they would be joining who are not online yet, um, and so in anticipating that we might be able to move to our wait list, which we also have um, a couple of people listed there. Um, also just wanted to generally make make sure that everyone knew that that platform will be available we because we're anticipating to have a little bit of time left at the end after all of our our speakers and so if you do have comments that you would like to give and you did not indicate that you wanted to to when when you registered um that's fine we will have the ability to um either allow you to unmute yourself and provide those comments or or promote you to be a panelist after after we get through the, the slate of speakers that we have lined up. Um, and so that's just a note to uh, generally prepare yourself. If you, if you would like to speak, we'll have that opportunity as well. Thanks. Great. And then next slide, please. Um, and just to note that this is a public session and uh, we will be recording this session for future reference as we consider the input that's provided. And um, just please take note of these, uh, these disclaimers about uh, in particular that the contributions and comments that are made um, during the session will be part of the public record. Um, and finally, that today's presentations and discussions are pre presented to the committee. They're not 
Um, they are not opinions, findings, or recommendations of the committee. Um, so with that, I would like to invite uh, Mike Cooperberg from USGCRP to provide a, a, a welcome on their behalf. Thanks, Stephen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mike Cooperberg. I'm the executive director of the US Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. USGCRP is managed by the Subcommittee on Global Change Research, which consists of representatives from the 13 federal agencies that make up the US Global Change Research Program. You can think of this subcommittee as the board of directors for USGCRP. I'm here today representing those 13 agencies, and we want you to know that we're serious about our legislative mandate, which is to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict and respond to human induced and natural processes of global change. On behalf of USGCRP, thank you for your interest, for your time and your expertise. Your input will be heard and considered as we draft and implement a new 10 year strategic plan for USGCRP. In addition to the staff from the National Academies, there are a number of federal agency representatives and from the US National Coordination Office for USGCRP on the line today. They'll be listening carefully and taking notes that will inform our discussions and writing for the new plan. That new plan will be completed late next year. Between now and then, you can comment on a prospectus that is a high-level outline of the plan. The prospectus was released for public comment today, I'm happy to say. That's out on the, on the website, and I think um, that April put a link to that prospectus in the, the chat. A full draft of the plan will be released for public comment and for review by this committee of the National Academies in the middle of 2022. So please take advantage of these opportunities to provide input and comment to us. We do want to hear what you think and what you have to say, and we will take all of your comments into consideration. Finally, on behalf of USGCRP, our sincere thanks to you for taking the time to speak to us today to the committee to advise USGCRP and to the staff of the National Academies for organizing these sessions. Specifically, I wanna thank Allison Grantham for our, being our host today, Stephen Stitcher, Amanda Stout, April Melvin, and Amanda Purcell for all the work they've done to organize these meetings and to support the committee itself. I also wanna say thank you to Katie Reeves and Julie Morris from the US Global Change Research Program's National Coordination Office for their roles in making this happen. We look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you again for being here. Stephen. I'd like to invite Allison back on to uh, walk us through our speakers. Awesome. Uh, I am here and I would like to welcome Megan uh, Daly, I believe. Sorry. That's correct. Yes, as our first speaker, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to provide comments and look forward to hearing the other comments as well from the other panelists and speakers today. Um, I am speaking on behalf of the Center for Food System Security at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we have recognized some large scale scientific questions related to global change that we believe uh, uh, need to be addressed. And one of these is trying to understand the balance between efficiency and resiliency within the food supply chain uh, when it comes to managing risk. The one thing that we're all familiar with is that we currently still live in legacy programs that are set up uh, and built on understanding efficiency within the supply chain, and that we need to move beyond that and build a resilient food supply chain. But this is going to require technology and analytical tools that can allow companies and governments to assess the risks as we move across the continuum from uh, efficiency to resiliency under varying environmental circumstances. We believe that although it's very beneficial uh, in order to start from scratch with building a lot of these tools, that one way in order to move this faster could be by expanding existing analytics and insurance or in investment analytics that are used for food or food companies. Uh, we also believe that it's incredibly important to include on this efficiency to resiliency in a very broad term, everything as far as resiliency from producing food, from the transportation logistics to also the resiliency of community food systems. Uh, 
And so we want to integrate the social and economic components into this uh, balance. And in doing so, we believe that we have to ask questions about you know, how will the cost burden be distributed if we move towards a more resilient framework? This includes ensuring that small and medium companies have the same opportunities as large scale businesses and that the cost burden really isn't just carried solely by farmers or by consumers. One of the other things that we're seeing is that as ESG or environmental social governance and climate compliance expands, including the projected Securities and Exchange Commission uh, compliance for the largest food and ag companies. We understand that then there's a need for increased technology in measuring a number of the different climate variables from on-farm to farm-to-table transportation. So this includes currently, even with any sort of client compliance, we're usually limited to carbon compliance, but not necessarily anything beyond that. And so we need to figure out the sensors that are necessary, some of the different logistics and the analytics that are required in order to measure additional variables under this kind of ESG reporting that's going to continue to increase. We also believe that along with this, it shouldn't just be those climate variables. We need to ensure that there's the social part of this as well as the governance. And again, expanding into uh, variables for economic and uh, social systems. There's, with moving this forward, we understand that we need to have standards on how to measure and how to report this type of compliance as well. And that we think that this needs to happen at the industry level, not necessarily from the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, because we believe that the technologies continue to increase at a rapid pace. Something that we believe there's a huge gap in is large scale public private partnerships. We think that these are important, just like what we're seeing today, because it allows for diverse viewpoints to be put forward. But also we think that these public private partnerships are critically important because we need data across each of these companies, public and private, and across the entire food supply chain in order to analyze these data as a whole. Because the data is much more valuable if we can aggregate it and see the whole system. We believe that this will help us to predict and forecast as well as to adapt and mitigate to any sort of climate change or any other sort of global change that uh, we're gonna see over the next many years. We also believe that it's important to have these public-private partnerships because this will allow us to have greater data exchanges across the supply chain. We currently see that each sector and each co company tends to work independently and that if we want to be able to have transparency in the food supply chain, we have to have some sort of data interchange from each sector, or each company across that supply chain. In order to move this forward, we know that this is a long-term solution to uh, very long-term challenges. We need to develop a workforce that is diverse. We have to be able to continue to push uh, STEM research, both natural and social sciences, as well as systems level thinking through K through 12 and our undergraduate institutions. This will put, we also need to be able to provide some opportunities for these diverse students to be exposed to global change research and provide full scholarships for diverse students to enter into educational and career pathways in global change research. Thank you so much. All right, for the delay there, um, I was trying to unmute myself. I would like to thank you very much, um, Dr. Daly, for those comments. I would now um, like to welcome Leticia Noguera from the American Cancer Society to offer comments. Hey, thank you so much. I'm Dr. Leticia Noguera. I'm a researcher at the American Cancer Society, and I did watch the video before the meeting. I, I was, we we're especially interested in the interagency role uh, we know that our current food system encourages consumption of foods that are not only unhealthy, but also have huge environmental and social impact. Um, so we would need more research and more methods for estimating, as uh, Amanda was saying, the um, health and social cost of the current food system and the food choices, um, not only uh, through regulation, but also through food labeling and advertising and what types of products are available to 
consumers and how uh, we could increase the diversity of products, uh, not only from subsidized crops, but also that their uh, products available to consumers are more culturally inclusive. Um, the current health, the, the current food system also impacts the health of agricultural workers and the communities living around the places where food is produced. There's uh, increased exposure to pesticides, antibiotics, and uh, you've probably heard of the manure lagoons too from the waste produced by some food pro products. So I think that there, uh, we would like to see more research on estimating the true co cost of the current food, food system on uh, not only the food consumption, but the health of people who are eating the food and producing the food, the environment and the society. And the government's role not only is funding re research, but also in regulating the type of food uh, that is available, the food label, food advertising, and uh, the enforcing some of the Clean Air and Clean Water Act as it regards to food production and also the government's role as a consumer, such as some uh, incentives for school consumption, uh, children consumption of food and uh, farm to school projects. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much um, for those comments. Um, I would now like um, to welcome Michael Rust to offer comments. Uh, thank you very much, um, and thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Um, they pertain to the opportunity to turn the ocean, to turn to the ocean when we think about food, energy, climate mitigation, climate adaptation, and and related nexuses. Uh, the ocean covers 70% of the Earth's surface and therefore receives about 70% of the sunlight that powers our world. And the ocean contains about 97% of the Earth's water, yet it produces a um, little less than 2% of man's food. Um, instead, currently we use some 70% or so of our water and 40% or so of our land to produce 98% of our food. Uh, the land, however, and the sea systems are complementary, especially when we think about climate and we think about resiliency and the, and the need to be diverse to produce healthy, diverse food. Um, but what the, what the sea brings is, is to imagine a food production system that uses no or little land, uh, no or little fresh water, needs no or little fertilizer, and it's a system which is largely immune from, from floods and droughts. Um, so in that way, it's very complementary to, to what we do in agriculture. Uh, 2021 is the first year of the International Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development. This platform provides a unique opportunity for global discussion of the future of ocean-based food production. Uh, conditions uh, or connections such as this can also help increase the interaction of the producers of science and the users of science. Um, an international effort is also likely going to be the best option for the U.S. to advance in this field. Um, just based upon a, a back of the envelope calculation with a quick Google search of budget numbers for NOAA and USDA, it appears that for about every dollar the US spends on marine aquaculture research and development at the federal level, it spends about $50 on fisheries management issues. But even more lopsided for every dollar of uh, marine aquaculture spending, uh, we spend on the order of $5,000 for agriculture. This is likely similar for other uh, countries in the Western hemisphere, as well as the EU. Um, and it's probably roughly proportional to the value of those industries uh, at current, um, but it's not necessarily appropriate for the future potential of each industry, especially when we consider uh, food production in a, in a changing climate. The practical result of this is to obtain the critical mass of science needed to make significant advances, we need to cooperate, and that needs to be on the international scale. Um, and finally, at the COP26 meeting, the U.S. joined the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. This effort was led by the heads of state from 14 different countries prior to COP26, and then grew significantly as a result of other countries, including the U.S., joining. Uh, the high-level panel sees the ocean as an opportunity to use aquaculture as a way not only to provide sustainable blue foods in quantities uh, of significant amounts to feed humanity for the next half a century, but also as a way to fight climate change. 
I suggest the uh, USGCRP take a look at the work of this panel as a potential roadmap that can help humanity deal with climate change and continue to thrive in the process. Uh, two takeaways are the ocean is more than a victim of climate change. It has the potential for, to, for being a superhero in mitigation and adaptation and provide healthy, sustainable food at levels on par with land-based food production by focusing on marine aquaculture. Given the small effort that the US and Western countries have made to develop ocean-based aquaculture and its rudimentary level of development, it will take a world effort to move forward. However, the fact that ocean aquaculture is not developed gives us a blank slate to build in use-inspired science that includes social and economic topics and addresses issues including those of environmental, social justice, and diversity at the start. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rust, for your comments. Uh, we will now um, move on to Gigi Owen of the University of Arizona. Hey, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, my name is Dr. Gigi Owen. I am a social scientist at the Climate Assessment for the Southwest program, uh, which is a NOAA RISA program housed at the University of Arizona. And over the past year and a half, I've been working with people across all nodes of the regional food system here in Southern Arizona. Um, and we've been investigating the impacts of COVID on these food systems and looking for evidence of resilience within these systems in the face of the COVID crisis, kind of glean lessons from these pandemic responses that then might also apply to climate adaptation responses. So my two points that I'm sharing today both stem from that research. My first point focuses on applying climate research to the needs of next generation farmers and ranchers, especially those who produce in local and regional food system contexts. Many young farmers are highly concerned about climate and changes to water availability, changes to soil health, and they really want to and are trying out ways to grow food um, that conserve water and um, grow food in ways that conserve water and improve the soil. Um, the National Young Farmer and Rancher Coalition has done a lot of work to support these next generations of farmers and ranchers. And in a recent survey of their members, they found that water availability, climate change, and drought are among the top agricultural concerns of young farmers in the arid U.S. West. Um, and many of these farmers are trying to implement climate adapt adapted techniques on their farms, uh, like water conservation and efficient irrigation systems. Um, or building soil health by incorporating practices such as cover cropping, crop rotation, no-till, and rotational grazing. Um, so in terms of climate information needs, this group is a perfect match to engage around the types, um, learning about the types of information that would be useful and could be helpful for identifying future research needs. Um, they've also been systematically under-resourced, as many of these young farmers and ranches, ranchers do not typically come from generational wealth or even from farming families, um, so they have to find ways to buy or lease their own land and access water, um, as many of them are typically small, smaller to medium-sized businesses. Uh, they've also been underserved by State Departments of Agriculture and the USDA. Um, both in terms of financial support and also in uh, research technology development and um, information. Um, there are several agricultural workforce development programs in various states. I know New Mexico has implemented one in the last couple of years and Arizona just approved a program this past summer. And these are a really good start to create new opportunities for new farmers and ranchers, um, especially people who have uh, who are underrepresented in, in our agricultural systems. Um, so these types of workforce development programs, I know ours is run through the um, Cooperative Extension Program, they could really benefit from targeted um, regional climate change and adaptation information, information and research. Uh, my second point is that although we tend to emphasize connections between climate and food production, obviously for good reason, we really need to expand our understanding of climate impacts to the other nodes of the food system, uh, namely distribution, processing, and waste. Um, two of the biggest issues that we have heard from people who work in the food system here in Southern Arizona are around food storage and transportation. Um, increased heat impacts the shelf life of food, so both fresh and dry goods. Um, and this is already having an impact on distribution here for both food retail and for food banks and food pantries. 
um, as well as an increased need for adequate cold storage and cooling during transport to ensure um, food safety um, and so that food doesn't go bad during that uh, transportation process. Um, also climate related safety issues include increased dust storms on the road during transport as well as impacts on the paved roads and transportation infrastructure. Um, higher maximum and minimum temperatures, increase the use of air conditioning in business establishments um, and distribution and processing facilities, which drive energy consumption and costs. And although these impacts aren't unique to the food systems, any breakdowns in these areas can have huge impacts on our food supply chain, as we've seen and continue to see throughout the COVID pandemic. Um, and of course, uh, I am running out of time, but food waste is a huge issue as a contributor to emissions. And there are several promising avenues to deal with waste that need to be implemented and then also evaluated across the US. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. Great, um, thank you. I just wanted to give a heads up that we will have some time for, uh, for contributions from the audience. So um, for those of you who are listening, uh, we welcome your input as well. And after the next speaker or two, we will, um, we will ask for interest from the audience. Um, so, um, Allison, if you can go ahead with the, the next speakers. All right, um, our next speaker is Dr. Franklin Egan um, from um, PASA and uh, Regen um, AI, is that correct? Or uh, Regen, Regen All? Okay, yeah. all right. Got it, um, over to you. Great, thank you, Allison. And thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, as Allison mentioned, I worked for, for PASA Sustainable Agriculture, which is a farmer's organization active in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic. We provide training, research, and technical support for uh, all manners of farmers from small vegetables to large row crop and, and CAFO dairies. Um, one of, one of the activities that I've been really engaged with has been a um, citizen science uh, soil health project called the Soil Health Benchmark Study. And through that have been um, talking for years with farmers about soil health and climate adaptation and uh, wanted to make a few points related to that. Uh, the first is just that it's very clear and I, I know that, that the data um, that US that this program has helped provide um, makes very clear is that climate change in the Northeast, one of the you know, most visible and, and extreme aspects of that have been our changes in precipitation pattern uh, with most of our rainfall or more of our rainfall coming in very heavy sudden doses um, and that being quite predictable in terms of its timing, quite unpredictable in terms of its timing during the growing season. Uh, this is creating lots of challenges for farmers uh, as they increasingly try to figure out how to cram uh, more operations into a narrower, narrower and more unpredictable range of uh, field readiness days. And so uh, just one trend that I'm aware of how this has been playing out as we've been seeing on dairy farms increasingly a move away from uh, perennial crops like alfalfa that can build soil towards um, annual crops because it's become quite difficult to manage multiple cuttings of hay. And there are lots of trends like this uh, and I think it points to um, a, a real need for, for research both in terms of decision support tools that could help farmers understand um, trends and changes, uh, not just in things like um, uh, frost-free days, but um, field readiness and precipitation patterns uh, and other technologies that can help manage extreme rainfall, uh, maybe very intensive interventions like tiling, which is not super common in the Northeast, but other things like more research into cover crop genetics that might provide farmers more opportunities to plant into smaller and, and varying windows. Uh, the second comment I wanted to make is um, that in this region, and I know throughout the country, uh, more and more farmers are getting interested in um, payment for ecosystem service services, especially uh, carbon credits. Um, and I just wanted to voice that, you know, with my experience in, in measuring soil health, measuring soil carbon, and I know uh, from, from many colleagues, 
Um, just wanted to voice a lot of skepticism about, you know, the, the ability to really do that at scale in terms of reliable, you know, measurement and verification for, for carbon markets. Uh, and wanted to encourage this committee to consider, you know, further and deeper research into the, the viability of national and international carbon markets. And when we're thinking about investing public dollars, um, kind of the return on investment of payment for ecosystem services versus payment for practices, which we have much more experience with um, NRCS programs like CSP or, or EQIP, uh, which I think could be revitalized in a number of ways. And then the last comment I'll make, and this is um, in relevance to a new, new organization I'm working with called Regional. Um, I've seen uh, that through the lens of local climate action, uh, local climate action plans for, for counties and, and rural communities, uh, there's just a tremendous opportunity there to connect uh, local policy around climate change to land stewardship and food and water issues and um, would, would really value more um, social science research into how that can be done effectively. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, yeah, I really value the work of uh, this community and everyone on the call. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Marianne Krasny from Cornell University. Thank you, Allison, and thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I'm on the faculty in the Cornell Department of Natural Resources and the Environment, and I work a lot with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cornell is a land-grant school in New York State. So our, my remarks today are about plant-rich diet as a means to reduce food emissions and improve people's health, as well as about food waste. In working with Cornell Cooperative Extension across the state, I have found that both rural areas like the Adirondack region and cities face similar issues of lack of access to healthy plant-rich foods. Whereas many people are familiar with urban food deserts, people in rural areas may have to drive miles to buy food and generally where they end up is at a gas station convenience store with few or no healthy options. Further, people including low-income residents on federal nutrition programs such as FNEP and SNAP may know little about plant-rich foods and how to prepare them. So I propose research on two areas related to plant-rich diet. First is the barriers to accessing healthy diets, including barriers related to physical availability of plant-rich rich foods and to people's awareness of the benefits and knowledge of how to prepare such foods. And second, to look at innovative policies and practices that incentivize and otherwise work to enable access to healthy plant-rich foods. Such research conducted in rural and urban low-income communities addresses concerns about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And working with Cooperative Extension can also help to ensure youth-inspired research. For example, I reached out to a Cooperative Extension educator in preparation for my remarks, and she asked me to include in my comments today research into the effectiveness of youth education related to produce consumption, for example, preparation and taste testing. A focus on policies such as plant-rich procurement programs in schools, hospitals, and other institutions, and subsidies for dairy and livestock farmers converting grains and produce, um, or subsidies for that matter um, for uh, alternatives to meat and dairy, Plus, the impact of innovative food access programs, such as farmers markets and CSAs, will address socioeconomic sciences integration. Finally, and importantly, I wanted to mention research on reducing food waste as a climate solution. I found uh, through volunteering with a food donation organization that grocery stores, at least in Ithaca and Tompkins County, are great at donating edible food to food recovery programs but a university like Cornell generates massive food waste in dining and in student residences, um, probably especially the off-campus residents because, well, and on-campus residents, but in dining, it's, there is at least some food waste um, diversion. So how to organize food recovery programs given health regulations and sorting of plate food from other plate waste, 
to enable composting, biogas generation, and animal feed, as well as how to promote use of dining food left at the end of the day with food locator apps are all needed research areas. So thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, I'm going to turn it over now um, to Stephen. Great. So thank, thank you to all of the speakers for their points. And we'd like to offer an opportunity now for anyone from who is participating in this, um, in this session to raise their hands and provide comments. Um, we are in a session that is around the theme of food and global change. Um, but as with all of these sessions, uh, we, we recognize that global change issues are cross-cutting and inter, um, interconnected. And we've already experienced that through the, through the comments that we've received today. Um, so we welcome comments from anyone on any of these topics related to glo global change on food or other topics as well. Um, so if you're interested in providing comments, I encourage you to go to the three dots uh, more menu on the bottom of your Zoom screen and just raise your hand and we will then have the opportunity to, to pull you up for audio, um, audio only contributions to our, um, to our session. Um, so if there's anyone who's interested in providing additional comments, either in, in to build on comments that we've already heard or other topics, um, now is a great op your opportunity to do so. Seeing any. Anybody want to want to add to what we've heard today? I am not at this point seeing any hands. Amanda, are you seeing? All right then. Um, so we want to thank you then for joining us today. And um, Nikki, if you can pull up the, the slides, the remaining slide, the next slide. Um, I'll just quickly go over next steps. We will be following up after this session with an email to all registrants uh, with a couple of op more opportunities to provide input, an evaluation on this session, as well as a call for input on to USGCRP. Um, so those who are interested in written comments, this is an opportunity in a structured way to provide some of those written comments as well. Um, we will be, we will be prom here, we, we will also be um, posting on the event page where you originally found information on this session, uh, the outputs from this, uh, from this session, a video recording and transcript of the session, for instance, will be available there. Um, and then finally, as we noted, all of the inputs from these listening sessions will be available to USGCRP and the advisor, advisory committee to inform their work going forward. Um, so with that, I'd like to invite Mike to come back on and um, provide a, a closing remarks for USGCRP and then Allison. Stephen, thank you very much. Again, on behalf of the US Global Change Research Program, our 13 agencies and many, many federal employees. We sincerely appreciate the time and the input. I was pleased with what we heard today. Very thoughtful, very prepared, um, and very insightful comments. We have notes of them. We'll capture the, the comments in the chat here, and this will go back to USGCRP for consideration as we develop the strategic plan. Again, I encourage you to take a look at the prospectus. Uh, you have a link from that in the chat. Um, it's a very high level outline of where we're starting and then look for a full draft of the plan for public comment in the middle of 2022. We are very much appreciative of your time, of the input. Thank you so, so much. We look forward to putting out a plan that we'll all be proud of. Thanks so much. And Allison, on behalf of the committee. Yes, on um, behalf of the committee, I would like to thank everyone for your active participation and contributions today. Um, and 
look forward to um, supporting dissemination of more information as it becomes available. Thank you. And just hold on one minute. As a final uh, parting comment, we have one more session on uh, Wednesday evening from 5 to 6.30 p.m. at Eastern time. We have a session on transportation and infrastructure, and we welcome your participation in that. And uh, one more opportunity to provide comment on any of the topics that have not been uh, addressed um, or where you see additional uh, attention that needs to be uh, paid to those to topics, whether they are specifically around transportation and infrastructure or other um, or other subjects. Um, so, thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll join us on on Wednesday. And uh, thank you for your interest in USGCRP and global change, addressing global change issues. <laughs>